thanks so much for having me. It's always really fun uh, to be in Chicago. I really do love Chicago. It always makes me question if I really am half Russian, if I can barely handle your cold. <laughs> Um, I, I, I'm really pr proud to be invited here, um, and, and I'm really happy to be talking to an audience that's concerned about high schools, uh, even though I run an organization that's primarily concerned uh, about freedom of speech, due process, academic freedom, and higher education. I want to do a lot more of outreach to students at a lot earlier ages to give them inspiring uh, philosophical explanations of why free speech matters for a compassionate, pluralistic, um, successful democratic society uh, in a way that I don't, I think unfortunately isn't being explained very well at the moment. Um, so I, I definitely am happy to talk more about that during questions. So coddling of the American mind, how good intentions and bad ideas are setting up a generation for failure is of course the title of my and Jonathan Haidt's book. It's pronounced Haidt, um, he, his name, it's kind of funny, I'm, I'm used to being the one whose name actually gets mangled the most. So it's nice to have a co-author who actually gets it, uh, who, who gets more of it than I do. So what do I mean by coddling? Um, now that's my son, Maxwell. Um, he turns one on Friday. Um, that's from, from a couple months ago. And I'm actually, I, I'm on record saying this in all sorts of ways. I'm not a big fan of, <laughs> of the title coddling of the American mind, uh, partially because I think that the problem isn't quite um, with the connotation of coddling. Uh, all we mean, and we explain this in the book, is all we mean is overprotection. Um, and that overprotection can sometimes have negative consequences. But keep in mind, overprotection is always sort of um, specific to what your situation is. And honestly, at this age, there's not a lot you can do to sort of overcoddle your kid. It's, a, it's actually a pretty, pretty fun stage. Um, but, the, but just as you know, our grandparents knew, just as our great-grandparents knew, and just as modern psychology knows, that um, a, uh, a virtue becomes a vice if taken a bit too far. Um, that's a lot of what uh, our book is, is really about, is sort of trying to remind people of the wisdom of the ancients and how it actually has a lot of uh, grounding. Um, it has a lot of support in, in modern psychological ideas, particularly cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, so I'm gonna go backwards a little bit here, uh, and I wanna give everybody here, my goal for tonight is to really give a, a sense uh, of the situation that I've seen on campus in my, at this point, nearly 20 years working out of free speech on campus. And I'm gonna paint a picture that's actually a lot more nuanced than I think people are, are used to hearing, and a, and a lot, and with uh, some stereotypes not exactly, uh, not exactly applying but actually getting to some of the findings of the book at the very end, and, ex and uh, hopefully by the time we get to the, uh, some of the assertions we make at the book uh, at the end, it will make a lot more sense why we, were, why we made them in the first place. So um, my first book in 2012 was called Unlearning Liberty, uh, and at the time, the situation on campus was, um, unlike I, I, the stereotypes I'd heard, uh, was that students were absolutely the best constituency for freedom of speech on college campuses. They got, you know, they were fans of Dave Chappelle, they got everything from, you know, uh, racy humor to offensive movies to provocative professors. They were generally better about free speech than, in fact, a lot of professors, um, and certainly better than a lot of, a lot of administrators. Um, but of course, you know, when a lot of people think about the situation on campus uh, when it comes to freedom of speech, the first thing that comes to mind is political correctness, um, a term that I don't really love either, partially because it means such wildly different things to conservatives or liberals. When, when uh, conservatives hear it, they think brainwashing, and when liberals hear it, at least of my age, they think flight attendant instead of stewardess, which, you know, isn't the end of the word, world really. Um, but I've seen, you know, argue, uh, I've seen both kinds um, of, of, uh, of political correctness in my time on campus. But I wanted to give you an idea of some of the cases uh, that I've been fighting. Um, just a little bit more background. I went to law school specifically to do First Amendment law. Um, this was my passion from a very early age. I took every class that Stanford offered in First Amendment, and then when I ran out, I did six credits on censorship during the Tudor dynasty as an independent study. Um, I, I, uh, when I told one of my friends about that, he looked at me with horror and said, who's making you do that? <laughs> and I realized, oh wow, I'm a nerd for this, huh? <laughs> I love this stuff. But even, and then I worked for the ACLU of Northern California in 1999, um, and even with that background, uh, I was still shocked at how easy it was to get in trouble on college campuses in, in starting in 2001. 
Um, so my book, uh, the, a big story in my book is the Valdosta State University. Um, this is a, a case that's, I, I could take the whole night to explain the case because it, it is absolutely a horrifying example of censorship on campus, but not looking like you'd expect. The, um, to make a, long, a very long story quite short, a student was kicked out of college uh, without so much as a hearing because he was a clear and present danger because of this uh, Facebook collage that he placed up. Um, he was he's an environmentalist, uh, and he was upset that the university was deciding to do a uh, parking garage project when they, he thought there were more environmentally friendly and also less expensive ways um, to deal with congestion on campus. Um, he was brought into the president's office and dressed down for an hour and a half um, for this, his temerity in writing an article for the um, student newspaper, for contacting trustees, saying we really shouldn't do this project, there's less expensive ways to do it. And during the course of being dressed down by the university president, um, he was once again reminded that this uh, parking garage project was supposed to be part of the, the president's legacy um, to the university. It's a little sad. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, he's a really nice kid. So he, he, he felt, you know, um, very, he was apologetic. He didn't, he didn't want to upset, the, you know, President Zachary. Um, but then he was like, what, the, what just happened? <laughs> what, what, why was I just dressed down for an hour and a half by the president of my university about my, uh, what I have every right in the world to protest? So we put up, this is actually a, a recreation of the, um, of the collage he put up, very faithful recreation, just the original version was just Xerox to death. Um, and this is the, uh, the, uh, the poster he put up on Facebook. Um, and he was kicked out of school for it. Can anyone in the audience guess why? What's terrifying about this? What's frightening you right now about it? The small text. The small text. Oh, I hear you, man. I hear you. Um, yeah, I just, I, need, I just found out I need 150s. <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing before. Uh, so the argument that the university president, and now th since we were able to do discovery in this case, we found out the university president um, had been having meeting after meeting over the course of months about what to do about Hayden Barnes. And it's kind of comical to watch it in some ways because most of his staff was like, it's a student who doesn't want your parking garage project. <laughs> There's not really anything you can do about it. But after Hayden posted this on Facebook, he said, aha, Memorials happen when people are dead, so therefore, this is a threat on my life. Yeah, stretching it a little bit, uh, to say the least. Nobody around him believed him, and if anybody has any doubt about whether or not there was, this was seriously taken as a threat, two, two facts that I always like to remind people. The student in question is a Shambhala Buddhist. Um, it's the same kind of Buddhism that I study. We have lots of pictures of him you know, sitting in lotus position. Um, he's also a decorated EMT, so like a, a genuine hero. Um, so not the right guy to pick on for this. And to show you how sincere uh, their belief that their lives were in imminent danger from this, and I, they use the term clear and present danger in the letter, kicking him out, by the way, um, which is adorable if you're a First Amendment person. It's just so far off base. Um, but they, they slipped a note under his door saying, basically, dear clear and present danger, who's very dangerous to this university, please help yourself off this university. <laughs> you have 48 hours to go. Um, bye. <laughs> and, they, and they stapled the, the collage to it. And it's just kind of like, if you really think someone is a real threat, you don't invite them to politely uh, leave <laughs> the, the, the campus. Um, so this actually ended up being about a million dollar uh, lawsuit. Um, and those are the kind of cases I was dealing with uh, around the time that I, I wrote um, on learning liberty. And this is still one of the most outrageous cases I'd seen. But to give you a picture of, of some of the other kind of cases we've seen at FIRE. You know, some are, uh, some are absol absolutely do deal with political correctness. And I define political correctness more or less as meaning a in some cases, a little bit prim and proper uh, speech policing. Um, but the people who are involved in this case and what these cases actually look like also don't fit people's stereotypes in a lot of cases. So for example, the, uh, the person in the corner uh, at the fire podium is Chris Lee. Um, he made the mistake of trying to do a comedy musical at Washington State University in the spirit of South Park, um, and he ended up getting in serious trouble with his, with his administration um, for making a comedy musical. 
Um, that's, that story is also in Unlearning Liberty. Um, this is a student uh, with, uh, the, the student, uh, with Cornell West pointing at him. I had the temerity, and this is a much more recent case, to invite John Derbyshire um, to uh, Williams College in order to debate him uh, about uh, some of some racist things John Derbyshire had published. Um, it was supposed to be a debate, but Williams College decided, no, we're not going to allow you to have this person, even for the purpose of debate, step foot on this campus. Um, on the bottom, that's actually a, a piece of art that a very brave artist from Turkey, someone who's actually been willing to stand up to the Erdogan regime in, in Turkey, which is you're playing fast and loose with your life, um, and certainly your freedom if you do that these days. And at University of Iowa, he put this piece of uh, artwork up that if you uh, see it from a distance, it looks like Klan robes. But if you come up to it and you actually see what it is, it's newspaper clippings of stories of lynchings, of stories of uh, racism in the United States. It becomes really clear that what this is is a reminder of our uh, horrible past when it comes to race relations and, and, and of the Klan. Uh, but this was um, uh, taken down at University of Iowa because even though it was absolutely decidedly an anti-racist um, statement, uh, students didn't care. They, 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 they found it offensive no matter what and it had to go. And the middle one is, of course, um, Notre Dame versus the Klan. It's sort of a classic fire case. Um, this involves a janitor who was working his way through school, so not exactly you know, your typical privileged oppressor um, at, university, at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, uh, quite a mouthful. Um, and the book he was reading is Notre Dame versus the Klan. Um, it is about the defeat of, Notre, of, of the Klan when they marched on Notre Dame in 1926, I think. Um, I always get it confused because my, my, my father was born in 1926, so I always, I always get these mi mi uh, mixed up. Um, and th this joyously celebrates the fact that, that Notre Dame students came out and fought um, with the Klan in the streets uh, at, at, at Notre Dame and won. And so this is a joyously anti-racist book. Now, to be clear, even if he was reading Mein Kampf, it still is protected, but it's incredibly ironic, nonetheless, that this uh, student was found guilty of racial harassment because the cover of the book made people uncomfortable. The cover, they literally judged a book by its cover and this student was found guilty of, of racial harassment without so much as a hearing. So these are actually fairly typical cases. And I would call these political correctness cases. They just don't necessarily fit people's stereotypes of what political correctness on campus looks like. So I'm gonna talk about, so I'm gonna talk about six different trends that I've seen on campus. And it's, and it's a good way to explain how we got to where we are on campus. And the first trend for most of my career, um, it was usually fighting administrative overreach, um, administrators who were just going a bit too far. And a lot of these attempts um, at the time, uh, when I was studying cognitive behavioral therapy myself for, to deal with my own you know, depression and anxiety, um, it seemed that universities were regulating life on campus to such an extent that they seemed that very small um, uh, areas where they weren't regulating it to death could lead to the sky to fall, as we would say, like horrible things. And one of the great examples of this are the um, ever tenacious speech zones that pop up at universities and have uh, popped up at universities all throughout my career. Um, free speech zones are one, one way that uh, administrators refer to zones that are actually uh, severe limits on freedom of speech on campus. Uh, that where instead of saying you can always protest uh, at Hyde Park, you can always protest um, at this uh, in this gazebo, they become the only place that you can protest um, on campus. Uh, and that in a lot of cases you have to ask advanced permission to use the free speech zone. So here's, here's, some, here's some classic ones. Um, oh, you have to keep it. So this is University of Cincinnati. Um, this was a tiny little free speech zone. You can barely see it here. We, we put a green push pin here to, to point it out. The green push pin is about 100 times bigger than the free speech zone. This is the famous free speech swamp. Um, at University of Hawaii at Hilo. These were students who were trying to um, hand out, God forbid, copies of the Constitution um, and later to protest the NSA. Um, and they were told by administrators that one, they had to limit themselves to the swamp um, that they needed advanced permission for. And when they said, that doesn't sound right at a school bound by the First Amendment, 
uh, their response of the administrators, which is not a good fact if you're going into a lawsuit, was, this isn't the 60s anymore. <laughs> you can't just protest anywhere. And actually, we were kind of like, as far as the law is concerned, it is kind of still the 60s in some ways. Um, I saw this in person. I was unwilling to go down into it because of all this electrical stuff over here, and I, I didn't really want to get electrocuted. Um, I always include this one because it's just the saddest little free speech zone I've ever seen in my life. Um, the free speech zone is just these two squares right here uh, on either side of this sad little bulletin board. And this is Blinn College in Texas where they were, they, they were trying to tell a student that, well, you've got, you've got to reserve this in advance. <laughs> <laughs> um, to have the luxury of this free speech zone at Blinn College. And this one I say for last, it's actually the, er, the oldest one on the list, but this was definitely me sort of getting my feet wet with just getting fed up with free speech zones. Um, Texas Tech University um, expected all 28,000 students on its physically massive campus, one of physically one of the biggest schools in, in the country, 28,000 students, that if they, God forbid, they all wanted to exercise their freedom of speech, they had to fit <laughs> inside this gazebo, free speech gazebo, um, which uh, is, is something that their PR department should have known just didn't sound all that great. Um, I had one of my friends, and, and to be clear, by free speech activities, I'm not just talking protests. I'm talking handing out flyers. I'm talking getting people to sign petitions. I'm, I'm, uh, at West Virginia University, they literally said that all First Amendment activities had to be limited to their free speech zone. And of course, we're like, okay, First Amendment activities include what you wear, what you read. Um, I don't think you really know the law all that well if you're making that argument. I had one of my friends do the dimensional analysis of the free speech zone at Texas Tech University, and if, God forbid, all 28,000 students wanted to exercise their free speech rights at the same time, you would have to crush them down to the density of uranium-238. <laughs> and it's funny, I was like, oh, that's really funny. I'm like, no, no, it's, it's really uranium-238. <laughs> it's a very serious friend of mine. Um, so yeah, so the, the, these, and what I, what I feel like, I feel like the message that, the, that they're sending students is that free speech is something that you should be very afraid of, it has to be very controlled, it has to be very regulated. Um, and to me, that's a form of catastrophizing. That's a way of sort of telling students that the world is much scarier and, and needs, to, needs the iron hand of free speech zones to keep it from being too chaotic. Um, and then of course there's speech codes. Speech zones are a subset of speech codes. Um, speech codes, unfortunately, the modern iteration of them, um, after the great free speech victories of the 1960s and 70s, unfortunately, speech codes had a second life in, uh, starting in the 1980s. And like all movements in the history of censorship, and I do mean all, um, someone thought that they were doing something very good by passing some of these codes. Now, the first one that I point out is just, a, and it still enforces, best I can tell, at University of West Alabama, a, a school bound by the First Amendment, a ban on harsh text messages or emails. Now, that is the definition of vagueness and overbreadth. Um, and when I talk to students, I'm like, guys, every single one of you is guilty of violating this by someone else's definition at some point. You're leaving it to the good graces of administrators to decide when they're gonna use this, and I have to tell you, in my experience, you shouldn't really trust them with that power. But the bottom one is a, just a true classic, and it does show one of the problems that you see with speech codes, is they have a tendency to reappear. Um, in 1990, University of Connecticut passed a ban on the use of derogatory names, inconsiderate jokes, and inappropriately directed laughter. Um, a policy so broad and vague that it was laughed at an awful lot um, by the Hartford Current, by the local newspapers, and then ignominiously defeated in a uh, unpublished opinion in 1990. What's amazing is this policy popped up um, uh, verbatim at Drexel University 15 years later, and I'm always like wondering, the only way you could find this code would be Googling one of the most laughably unconstitutional codes a university had ever, uh, ever passed and just cutting and pasting it into your own policy. Um, so again, I think that this is, um, uh, I think that these send a message that words can uh, hurt you, that, um, that basically that people are telling students that they're more fragile than they are, that, that simply an inconsiderately directed joke, an inappropriately directed joke could be tantamount to um, the very real offense of, of harassment. Um, this is Pierce Colleges, this is another one we pointed out, just uh, you know, the, the slide fe speaks for itself. This is one that we're very close, I can't talk too much about it, but uh, we should have some good news in that case very shortly. 
Um, but here's some good news, and from given how much attention free speech on campus has gotten in the past couple of years, I do like to emphasize that there, you know, when people get pessimistic about it, I'm saying we've been fighting speech codes on campus, and when we first started evaluating them, when we first really got our system down pat to evaluate the codes of 450 top schools, um, which is a substantial portion of the entire college population given that we also emphasize large and prestigious schools, that 75% of them had speech codes that were what we would call laughably unconstitutional, like not close calls. Um, now, real quick review of First Amendment law. Uh, public colleges are bound by the First Amendment. Um, Non-sectarian private colleges are bound by the First Amendment, including my alma mater, Stanford, um, by uh, state law. So it's the one state in the country that actually has a, a law that applies First Amendment standards even to private schools. Private schools are generally, um, and very strongly in some states, less so in others, bound by their promises of freedom of speech. Um, so, for example, Yale, Princeton, Harvard, all promise free speech to high heaven, and generally in those jurisdictions, courts have found that if you promise it, you should deliver it, and the standard, of course, that you deliver um, is defined essentially by the First Amendment. So, back in 2007, when we really got our, 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 our evaluation process down, when we published, we found that about 75% of schools um, had red light speech codes. We've managed to get that down to, um, actually, this is, we're, we're going to be releasing this in a couple of weeks, but it's down below 30% now. And that's the result of a lot of work. That's the result of more than 70 lawsuits. That's the result of a speech code of the month program that we've been doing since 2006. Every month we name a ridiculously overbroad speech code. Um, and that's been very effective um, uh, at getting rid of uh, speech codes just by making, them, uh, by making them public. I do think it's kind of stunning that we've had this program, you know, since 2006, had a speech code every month, and we still have jaw-dropping ones every single month. So, uh, and the good news is that green light schools are going up. University of Chicago, shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, they've been leaders when it comes to, to, to free speech and, and um, heterodox thinking. Um, we've gone from having only about seven green light schools uh, to, uh, we're pushing, this is, uh, needs some updating, we're actually getting pretty close to 50, so there is good news on, on this front. Um, and then there are things that just defy uh, everybody's stereotypes about what campus free speech looks like. And this is a, something we talk about in the, in the book, uh, and I just always have to mention it because I find it so personally outrageous. Northern Michigan University uh, uh, started sending, we found out that uh, a student um, had gone to seek counseling at Northern Michigan University because she'd been raped. And after go going to counseling, uh, she received a note from the dean of students or from the uh, disciplinary office saying, oh, well, we see that you use the counseling services. By the way, if you mention thoughts of self-harm to your friends, you will be disciplined under the student code. Crazy. And w what's amazing about it is that, you know, the student actually hadn't said anything about self-harm, uh, but she did suddenly know that the dean of students was aware of the fact that she'd gone to the counseling center. And if you think about the advice they're giving students, they're saying, so if you're anxious and depressed, you should isolate yourself, and by the way, you're a burden on your friends? That's just, uh, just, just incredibly cruel. And as best we can tell, it comes from a weird combination of concern about lawsuits related to suicide, um, a misunderstanding of the fact that you do, when you have, you can have suicide clusters, that if someone kills themselves and then, uh, that, that sometimes these happen in pairs, but there's no evidence uh, at all that talking about it actually creates a suicide cluster. So it was just a total misunderstanding of what the law said, exercised in a very cruel way. Now this gives all sorts of mixed messages to students. We, uh, we care about your mental health, but we don't care about it because your friends are, can be easily led to kill themselves and we don't want you to talk to them. It's, it, it, it's a very strange case. And we talk about it in the chapter of, of uh, Coddling of the American Mind where we talk about the role of bureaucracy and how, much, how it makes things worse. Now, the other factor that, that um, makes things worse uh, is uh, unclear guidance from the Department of Education. Uh, there have been improvements in this in the past couple of years, but you know, I'm gonna cover this fairly quickly because it's not as, uh, it, we cover it in some detail in the book. Um, this is Laura Kipnis. Actually, raise your hand if you, if you know that name. So a, a good portion of you. 
Laura Kipnis is a feminist writer. She wrote something for uh, um, Chronicle Higher Education basically saying um, the way Title IX is currently interpreted is actually insulting and paternalizing to modern, to the feminists for her generation. Um, it, uh, for, and she, you know, she even came down saying that rules saying that students can't ever date uh, professors um, it was, it was uh, paternalistic. It was basically saying, who's to tell me that I can't? And this seems like the kind of things they were fighting against uh, back when she was in school. Um, and she talked about Title IX going too far, and, at, and this is at Northwestern University. Um, and she mentioned a lawsuit, didn't mention anything about the names of the students involved. And for writing an article saying that Title IX was being interpreted too strongly and curtailing freedom of speech on campus in a very popular, in the, probably the most popular uh, magazine, a news journal uh, read by administrators across the country, she suddenly found herself the target of a Title IX investigation for writing this article. She wasn't allowed to know who was charging her. She wasn't allowed to know what she had done. She wasn't allowed to have an attorney present. She, uh, so for about 72 days, she went through this uh, awful um, uh, process where she was being warned about talking to anybody about it, but then desperately trying to figure out what, 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 what was going on. And I can tell you that having worked on campuses and talked to professors, uh, this is not uncommon. Um, professors come to this, uh, uh, with stuff like this quite often. What makes Laura Kipnis very, very different, though, from those other professors is she wasn't having it. Um, she decided after 72 days of this nonsense that she would write an article called My, uh, uh, My Title IX Inquisition um, about how, for the previous article she had written, um, she'd been subjected to an investigation of her, or of her free speech. Unsurprisingly, Northwestern dropped the investigation, I think, uh, either that night or the next day. Not surprising there. Um, uh, it's, uh, one of FIRE's main weapons is to actually get, get the word out about these things. Uh, the story, unfortunately, doesn't end there. Um, it just gets more recursive, like a weird kind of perverse Escher painting. Um, she wrote a book about her experiences, about being investigated uh, for what she wrote, uh, um, for being critical of Title IX, and was once again brought up on charges of violating Title IX at Northwestern University for the book she wrote about being investigated for Title IX at her university. <laughs> Um, so we've been helping her a lot. <laughs> um, as of right now, we think that uh, everything but a defamation lawsuit by a student um, is, is all that remains there, and I think that's very unlikely to be successful. Um, this is uh, Louisiana State University uh, uh, Professor Terry Buchanan, who was fired from Louisiana State University, allegedly for swearing um, in class when she was trying to explain how if you're working with kids from different backgrounds, sometimes their parents will come in and ask you questions like, um, and say things like, so you're saying my son is a pussy. That's the actual quote. And I used to work with inner city high school kids in, in, in DC in the 90s, and I'm like, what, that is, that's nothing. <laughs> you know, that's, that, that's a light treatment. And what the university is claiming is that the D Department of Education's guidance that's so vague and broad was why they had to fire her. So we currently have this in court. We had a pretty bad draw for our district court uh, uh, judge. Uh, she was actually one of the uh, leaders of the boosters for Louisiana State University Alumni Association. Um, so we lost the district court. I'm really confident, though, that, that we're, that we're going to win going forward. This is a very clear case as far as at least First Amendment doctrine is concerned. So then we come to the professorate. Now, in sort of the, uh, and when I say trends, um, it, when it comes to free speech, the professors are always involved in some ways. In some ways it's positive, but it's mostly the case that professors end up uh, running afoul of whatever norms are uh, currently on campus. And this is a case where a professor decided that she didn't like a pro-life display at Northern Kentucky University. Um, so she said that she wanted to exercise her free speech rights and, and lead her students to destroy that, the, the students' um, tiny white crosses that were a protest of, of Roe v. Wade. Approved by the university, um, you know, legit and their property. Uh, and she, this is pictures of her actually destroying um, the Christian students' display. Um, she, and what's amazing about this is, after the interview, and she ended up getting fired for it because you don't have a First Amendment right to destroy someone else's art. It shouldn't ever occur to you that, that you did. Um, you don't have a, a First Amendment right not to be offended. That, that, that's impossible. That, that wouldn't work. But nonetheless, what, after she was um, uh, interviewed about it, it really did seem like she actually completely misunderstood um, what the First Amendment actually said. 
Um, but that's a rare case. Uh, more often than not, what we see are professors getting in trouble for what they say. And here's a pretty typical case. This is Chicago State University. Another case that I have to somewhat limit what I say about it because it's still in litigation, but just very simply, several years ago, students, um, two professors were running a blog saying that Chicago State University was corrupt and poorly managed. Um, it was a, uh, a, a blog complaining about uh, the mismanagement of Chicago State University. Um, and they were first accused of violating um, copyright by talking about Chicago State University, which was not a very good argument. Um, the next one was that they were accused of bullying the president of Chicago State University, which is like, congratulations, uh, you're, you're, you're protecting the, the helpless president of Chicago State University from the mean professor bullies. Um, the most serious accusation was that they then approached um, two female, uh, uh, a professor, one professor and one um, uh, administrator, asking them to file for false harassment claims against the two professors in question. And to their credit, one professor actually was willing to step down, um, and the other professor uh, uh, unfortunately, was was fired. So this is this is a real scandalous case, and this is this has been going on for years close by. And what's interesting is one of the things that held up this litigation here was the fact that CSU was looking like it might run into bankruptcy, which just leads me to say, so maybe you should have been listening to the people who were saying that there might be some mismanagement rather than trying to silence them. Maybe they they might have had a point. Um, and then there are cases that look exactly like, well, actually not quite exactly like what people's stereotypes of, of campus look like. This is a professor, John McAdams at Marquette University. He um, wrote a blog where he, was, where he generally complained about the fact that Marquette University, which is nominally Catholic, was not, was actually hostile. His, his premise was that it was hostile to Catholic ideas. A student brought to him a recording of a class with a, a junior, with a, uh, a, a not full professor, a junior a professor in training. Um, that was a debate class, and he asked if they could debate uh, gay marriage. Um, and he was told that they, no, they couldn't, that would be homophobic and offensive. And uh, the student brought this recording to Professor John McAdams, who wrote a column really just saying, like, this is, this is what I'm on about. Like, we're a Catholic school, nominally we actually don't believe in gay marriage, and we're not even allowed to debate it, because to debate it at a Catholic school would be considered offensive. Now, what happened when this got out was it led to a lot of uh, reaction from Fox News and from um, uh, people on Twitter sending hate mail to Marquette University, and it was nasty, but it was nonetheless not jo John Adams' fault uh, that, 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 ha that, that, had, that happened. He just reported what actually happened, and he was fired um, for, uh, for making this original blog post, which, as, you know, under the First Amendment, absolutely protected. Uh, the good news here is that uh, after a initial loss, um, the uh, circuit court decided that John McAdams, that Marquette's promises of free speech were real and they were serious, and John McAdams has been reinstated. He was required to start teaching again this fall. Probably was a little bit awkward um, <laughs> returning to the school that fought so hard to keep him um, from, from being a professor there. So, and that brings us to number five, um, student censors. And this is the one that, that uh, leads us most into what the book is, uh, to what led to the book. Like I said, for all of my career, the best constituency for campus um, for freedom of speech were, have always been the students until right around 2013, 2014. Working at FIRE, it was like someone flipped a switch and suddenly students who were usually on our side were demanding that speakers be disinvited, they were shouting down speakers they didn't like, they were demanding new microaggression policies, um, suddenly trigger warning, something we hadn't actually heard of before. Uh, you had some schools like Oberlin where students were demanding that these become essentially mandatory. Um, a lot of bad cases starting in 2013, 2014 um, that we didn't you know, we really didn't understand where they're coming from. Now, this is a picture of student liberalism that predates that. This is another attempt for someone to protest Roe v. Wade, another Christian group on campus. And these are little American flags at Dartmouth College. Uh, the reason why some of them are matted on the ground is because one student decided that he didn't like this display, so he decided to run it over with his car. Wildly dangerous, terrible idea, and made all the more ironic by the fact that he had a coexist bumper sticker on the back of his car. 
You can't make this stuff up. Um, so, okay, well, this is where I feel like a lot of people know, uh, know the story because it's been kind of hard to avoid. The scariest thing that I've seen in terms of trends, we started seeing um, attitudes for students regarding free speech go on a worrisome direction in 2013, 2014. The scariest thing we saw was outbreaks of violence, and the scariest one was at UC Berkeley. Um, I don't care if you like my um, The uh, if you sit down and watch the videos of what happened in response to a speaker in, in, a, in a violent demand that the speaker not speak on campus, they're really lucky that nobody was killed during this. Uh, actually, this is a good time for me to mention Pamela Pratsky uh, is in the audience. She, is, uh, she was the chief researcher on the book. She did amazing research. On, on this part of, of the book uh, really convinced us that the situation at uh, Berkeley was much worse than we thought. Uh, like I said, they're very lucky that nobody was killed during this. Um, and that, you know, of course, terrifies me because um, it went, it's kind of funny because you'll sometimes have people who have such profound misunderstandings of speech that they'll make arguments like, well, you know, it's, they're just really expressing themselves um, uh, in, 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 in this way. And I have to explain, no, Freedom of speech is a system by which we try to resolve disputes through words, not violence. Um, so in a, in a very real sense, violence is the antithesis of freedom of speech. Um, more, and much, much more recently, Sam, uh, Sam Abrams. Um, you might have read this in the New York Times, a, uh, an article uh, by a professor at Sarah Lawrence University. He wrote it, uh, making the pretty unremarkable claim in most circles that I know that administrators actually, just like professors, lean um, decidedly to the left. That not really a particularly controversial uh, thing, even in administrative circles, as best I could tell. Um, but what, after publishing this, and it was an empirical study, which he published in the New York Times, um, the students began demanding that he be fired uh, for, for publishing this, um, and including vandalizing his door, apparently trying to break into his office, um, and uh, allegedly was even told by the university president that maybe he should start looking for another job at another school. Um, so, uh, thankfully, the president of the university has, uh, at Sarah Lawrence has changed their tune. The most interesting change that we've seen is, uh, and that we talk about in the book is how uh, Twitter and how social media is playing into all this. And suddenly we have the phenomena of a conservative outrage mobs making everything that much worse. So now we have professors who have to be worried. They always had to be worried about um, the, what the press, uh, what the public relations department of the university would think if they said anything interesting or offensive. They always had to worry about what the general counsel's office would think if they said something that someone could even slightly claim might be um, offensive to the point of discrimination or harassment. And believe me, those definitions can be very vague and broad. But now they, uh, but as of 2013, they have to worry about what the least charitable, most easily offended student or class would think. And then they have to start worrying about what Fox News, what the conservative Twitter sphere would think. This is a professor, Lisa Durden. She went on Tucker Carlson, possibly not the best idea, um, to defend a party that she didn't go to at her New Jersey college um, that was a Black Lives Matter party in which only black students were invited. Um, she defended it. Again, she didn't attend. It wasn't at her college. Uh, but she was nonetheless fired from her job because the university was afraid of sort of, uh, of, of nasty backlash from it. Um, they did get, uh, she got death threats, they got some nasty emails, um, but when we finally did a, um, a freedom of information request for how many emails was this avalanche of hate mail that they got uh, after Lisa Durden um, uh, was fired, they actually could only produce one. <laughs> Um, so it wasn't as bad as I thought, but the reason why I, always, I just feel morally compelled to, to, to point this case out is because this is, unlike a lot of uh, professors that we talk about, this is a professor who got fired, and this got very little national attention. Um, and she still is out of a job um, to this day, and it doesn't get covered for some reason. I don't really get that. Uh, more recently, since the book came out, Jim Livingston, he, he uh, posted a pr pretty angry rant on Facebook but it was a very typical, uh, I lived in New York for 10 years, um, and he was complaining about uh, gentrification of, Har uh, of Harlem. He was mad, uh, he was mad at some particular uh, white kids that he saw, he thought were acting like jackasses. So he, he, he wrote a, a rant saying, I want to resign from the right white race, you know. And uh, again, you know, for those of you who've lived in New York, it's not, it, it's a rant that you'll hear people make sometimes, sometimes, um, and, and he made it on Facebook. He was found guilty of racial harassment of white students. 
um, at Rutgers uh, University. You might notice something about uh, Professor Livingston, um, which makes it less likely that he actually hates all white people. Um, maybe he does. Um, but we eventually, uh, we eventually got Rutgers to back down in this case. Um, but here's the important point. All of this stuff is happening at the same time. Um, it's not as if these trends that I'm talking about, one ended and, uh, and then the next one started. Um, you have to worry about all these forces at once. Like I said, I don't envy professors right now because there are a lot of forces. It can be really easy to say the wrong thing and get yourself in trouble. Now, how does this relate? Uh, oh, yeah, and if you want to see an example of all of these things happening all at the same time, uh, everything from the angry students to the administration losing its mind to relatively tame speech being treated as if it's uh, some horrible uh, diatribe, um, and then uh, uh, some backlash from conservative uh, Twitter, all of it's in the, in, in, the, in the Brett Weinstein case at Evergreen State University, which we cover in some detail in the book, which is uh, really kind of horrifying. So one of the things that really made the 2013-2014 movement different was it was the first time I saw students really relying on um, strong claims of medicalization for the justification for censorship. And what do I mean by medicalization? I mean that they were saying not I don't want this person here because they're a bigot. I don't want this person here because it's hate speech. I don't want this person here because uh, I just think they're wrong. Um, they're saying, uh, I don't want this person here because usually it wasn't the advocate themselves. These people over here will be psychologically harmed if that person is even on our campus. Um, and that was an argument that we weren't used to seeing. And I'm kind of a hobbyist when it comes to psychology. I, I, I know, um, and uh, you know, a little bit of a personal note, and I talk about this in the book. Um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy really saved my life. Um, in 2007, I, I slipped into a very dangerous depression, and what helped me was um, cognitive behavioral therapy. And cognitive behavioral therapy isn't about saying you have to wall the world off from yourself. Um, it's about uh, actually learning to uh, intermediate your own thoughts. You know, there's, there's a wonderful Stoic tradition saying, you know, Hamlet quotes it well, and I'm going to butcher Hamlet now, but saying that nothing can harm you as much as your own thoughts unmonitored. Um, that essentially, and that's part of Stoic tradition, it's part of Buddhist tradition, that essentially there's, an, there, there's a moment when you have to decide and you have to learn the discipline of whether or not you're going to let someone harm you with their words or, or, or actions. And that's the wisdom in, in cognitive behavioral therapy. And so I was looking at this, seeing these justifications for censorship on campus and saying, not only are these bad for free speech, these seem like these would be terrible for mental health. Um, and so I'll give you some examples of what cognitive distortions are. They include things like mind reading, fortune telling, catastrophizing. I'm not defining most of these because they really do sound exactly, like they are what they sound like. Discounting positives, negative filtering, labeling overgeneralizing emotional reasoning. Emotional reasoning means the idea that your emotions um, uh, tell you exactly what you must do. And that if you feel dark one day, that must mean something really terrible is happening and something is really wrong. And that's, uh, I think that's most closely related to sort of Buddhism where you get in the habit of seeing your emotions as weather. That sometimes you're, sometimes you're down for no good reason. <laughs> Sometimes you're down because you're, you didn't eat enough sugar. Um, sometimes you are down for a real reason, but you shouldn't always assume uncritically uh, that it's something that uh, someone else has to change in the world is to blame. Uh, and then, of course, blaming, dichotomous thinking. I'm very guilty of this. I, but my wife makes fun of me all the time for the fact that it's like, it's all going to be great or it's all going to be horrible. And I don't really mean to think that way, but it's definitely, uh, you know, a... Uh, pattern that an awful lot of us fall, fall into, and I, and I work on it myself, overgeneralizing. If you think about some of the way we co conduct um, debates on campus today and off campus, there's a hell of a lot of overgeneralizing. There's a hell of a lot of labeling. There's a hell of a lot of discounting positive, fortune-telling, mind-reading, all this stuff. And one of the reasons why I'm such an advocate of CBT is that I want people to get over the T part of it. I want people to get over the therapy part of it. Because what's amazing is if you get into habit of, not, of seeing these um, cognitive distortions in yourself it is actually a very effective path to getting over anxiety and depression and mood disorders. That's amazing. Uh, applied stoic thought has such a great track record. It's, it's as effective as Prozac for, for many people. Um, but the other thing that I get very excited about is what if we actually started applying these rules to the way we argue with each other? 
What if our political discourse was full of people who actually took a moment before they decided to make their statement and said, maybe I'm overgeneralizing, <laughs> maybe I'm blaming, maybe I'm engaged in emotional reasoning, maybe I'm uh, engaged in binary thinking, discounting positives. Um, I think that there's some keys in here to the way we can argue safe, uh, we can argue effectively with ourselves and argue effectively with each other. And they are very much one and the same of good, tact good ways of having responsible, productive argument for a society as well. It's one of the reasons why I'm such a big advocate of the wisdom of CBT because I think its wisdom goes well beyond the therapeutic. So uh, we wrote the original article in 2015. Um, it was well received uh, and we thought we were all done. Um, uh, it was in August of 20, uh, 2015. Uh, we thought we'd done our job and then unfortunately things got a lot worse on campus. So we decided to write a book. Um, the original article, uh, I, I fought against it being called Coddling in the American Mind because I didn't like that title, as I mentioned before. I wanted it to be called The Incredibly Dull Arguing Towards Misery, um, which <laughs> probably is a good thing I lost on that one. Uh, but I went into the second book being like, but one thing it's not going to be called is Coddling of the American Mind. <laughs> And I even got height on my side on this one, um, but we never came up with a particularly good title. But to really get a better sense of what Coddling the American Mind is about, you should understand what my preferred title was, was the also, frankly, quite boring, Disempowered, um, is I think that we're taking some of these exceptionally, because I don't really think, when people hear coddling, they think of um, people who are pampered, they think of people who are spoiled, um, we make the case that we're just saying um, that, 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 um, uh, that we're overprotecting. But in a lot of cases, I think these students are very hardworking, very diligent students who have been, you know, um, I, forgive me if I said this already, I think I said it in a discussion with Lonnie. They're like, you know, finely, perfectly designed pieces of high technology, perfect rockets designed to get themselves into University of Chicago and Princeton. But in the course of doing that, we've left out all of these life skills that give people a sense of autonomy, a sense of locus of control, a sense of competence in, in their own lives. And if you take away someone's locus of control, if, you make, if you're implicitly telling them that, that you have to be scheduled from 6 a.m. to 10 o'clock at night, and by the way, ask my advice on everything you do, um, you're really telling them that they can't handle this on their own. And that's why we shouldn't be surprised, although we should be distressed by how much anxiety and depression has gone up. Now, when John and I were writing the original article, we heard plenty of stories of overwhelmed campus counseling centers um, with really high rates of anxiety and depression, seemingly overnight things bumping up really badly. But, you know, I, I know enough about social science, and John is a social scientist, um, that, uh, you know, you expect curves to be kind of slight, the, the, that, that increases. So we thought there might be a modest increase in depression and anxiety on campus. And then we found that it was actually not so modest. Um, depression rates, this is a, a chart of depression rates for students, uh, for, for girls and boys. Uh, boys hasn't gone up that much, but depression rate, uh, and this is, this is clinical depression in a year. Um, for those of you who've actually experienced clinical depression, it's not the blues. Um, it is something, depending on uh, how bad it is, life-threatening. Um, and that's a, a, a market increase right around the time that we were, uh, that we were seeing uh, this problem on campus. And it all starts in 2012-2013. Um, we also see the same, uh, the, the same trends on campus, just a straight line straight up um, from this uh, Penn State study. And of course people will bring, they'll say, and it's absolutely valid to say, fine, in every study you see an increase in self-harm, you see an increase in reports of depression, an increase in reports of anxiety, you see you know, data about um, increased uh, uh, diagnoses of, of anxiety uh, and, and, and other mood disorders. Um, and, but you know, people have a lot of you know, potential kind of like, well, maybe that's just because we've widened the definition or maybe people are more comfortable um, talking about uh, mental health issues, um, and that's all stuff that you have to consider. But we're skeptical that it isn't representing a very real and serious phenomenon when the, when the curves for all the other problems we've seen are reflected in something that you really can't fake, uh, which is suicide. Um, the suicide rate for men uh, have gone up uh, since the first decade of, of, this, um, of this millennia uh, by 25%. That's bad. 25% increase is very bad. Um, that's, that brings it to uh, levels we haven't seen since the early 1980s. Um, it's, you know, 25% is a big increase. For women, it's gone up 70%.
if you count from 2008 to today, it's gone up, it's doubled. Um, and these curves look exactly like the same anxiety and depression ones that we saw. Um, I think that part of this is disempowering them. The whole book really more or less is trying to figure out why, we, why this all happened in 2013, 2014. We believe that it's a generation that had some idiosyncratic misfortunes, including being the first generation to be guinea pigs to social media and smartphones. But we talk about six other um, uh, phenomena. But the backbone of our book um, is, oh, oh, interesting. Okay, um, is this, uh, we call them the three great untruths. Uh, just like the premise of our article, I, uh, John and I believe that it's as if we are giving a generation um, a terrible advice, like about the worst advice you could imagine, including, by the way, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker, always trust your feelings. That one sounds nice, but ultimately, as I said, emotional reasoning is something that generally mature people have to learn to talk back to and overcome. That uh, people, th th it sounds nice because people here follow your heart, go to your one true love, and that, and that, that sounds swell. Uh, but you probably shouldn't punch everybody who makes you angry, for example. Um, and the untruth of us versus them, life is a battle between good people and bad people, and, and, and evil people, sorry. Um, now, we don't think we're directly giving a generation of students this advice, but we do think we're giving it by example. We do, we do think we're giving this advice imp Im implicitly. Um, and in, in short, uh, what we're saying is we shouldn't be surprised that we have a generation of students that are increasingly anxious, increasingly depressed, and increasingly polarized because we've essentially been telling them the mental habits of anxious, depressed, and polarized people. So what can we do? Um, what can high schools do? Uh, you know, very, I, I want to start with really simple things, but I start with simple things for a reason. There's a lot of fatalism around the issues we talk about in the book. I don't want people to be fatalistic until we start doing some really basic things. You know, teach civics host debates, better yet, assign debates. Uh, you know, if I could wave a magic wand, every student in their junior year of high school would have to do an Oxford-style debate in which part of the rule is you had to take the opposite position from what you actually believed. Um, in the current environment, it would be insanely controversial, but it shouldn't be. You should get in the habits of being able to uh, take things from other people's perspective. It's part of critical thinking, and it's one of the parts of critical thinking that has been uh, when you do the social science on how good uh, um, students are today at, at perspective taking that's been in, uh, in kind of free fall, and a very bad decline um, by some of the studies they've done of it. I teach the philosophy of freedom of speech, and it's important to civil, uh, uh, civil and human rights. Uh, FIRE has materials already. We're at uh, www.thefire.org. I want to do a lot more of this, and I'm definitely happy to talk more uh, with people from Nutrier about how, um, how, you, how you can help out with this. Um, so what can students do? I was actually expecting there to be some more, uh, more students in the audience than there are. But um, research the college you want to attend and see if it's a green light school from FIRE. Educate yourself about the law and philosophy of freedom of speech. Uh, for example, FIRE's free speech guide written for students. Um, I wrote it <laughs> um, along with a bunch of other FIRE attorneys, including Harvey Silverglate, David, um, uh, David French contributed to it, Will, Will Creeley. Um, we, we think it's quite accessible. Uh, read anything by Jonathan Rausch, for goodness sakes, especially Kindly Inquisitors. It's one of the best philosophical explanations of freedom of speech written in the last 30 years. Um, and be prepared to fight for your, uh, for your own freedom and for the free speech more importantly, but more importantly, fight for the free speech of others. And this is the piece of advice that I always leave students with, and I just decided to make my own slide of it. Make it a lifelong habit to seek out smart people with whom you disagree. Um, this, is, this could solve an awful lot of the isolation. This could definitely help with great untruth, us versus them, a lot. Um, I think it could actually help a lot with um, uh, even the other great untruths and the anxiety around, I just assume you as evil person have nothing to say to me, and then you find out actually talking to you is not nearly as horrible as you thought. Uh, you may, it, may even, it may even end up dating, who knows. Uh, make it a lifelong habit to seek out smart people who, whom you disagree. I did have a, a somewhat depressing point uh, when I gave this talk out in New Mexico and someone came up to me, it's like, I'm, I, don't, I don't know if those people exist. And I was like, okay, you, <laughs> you probably need some work. 
Um, and what alumni parents and grandparents can do, don't give unrestricted gifts to colleges. Uh, ask some questions. I don't care if you give $100 to them. Ask, do you have a speech code? Do you teach about, orient uh, do you teach about free speech at orientation? Have you passed the Chicago Statement? Do you pledge to protect controversial speakers? And do you pledge to, prompt, to, to punish students who actually engage in violence? That's been one of the outrageous things that's happened with some of these incidents of violence is that the people who did it weren't held accountable, and that's not good. That can lead very quickly to a very bad downward spiral. Um, and I'm going to leave you with a final quote from Alan Charles Coors uh, about what's at stake. Uh, and here is my contact information. Um, so I, I love to get feedback. Um, we're going to take some questions for the next half an hour. But uh, in case you want to talk to me more directly, this is how you find me. Thank you so much for having me.